Welcome to this uh, UCL lunch hour lecture on weighing trees with lasers, new 3D insights from tropical forests to urban churchyards. Our speaker today is Matt Disney, who's Professor of Remote Sensing in the UCL Department of Geography, and also runs the, the carbon theme for the NERC National Center for Earth Observation. His research, as you'll see, is on measuring, so quantifying in various senses, um, plants and especially trees. And he's led new approaches in this area with a focus on using lasers from the ground, from air and from space to explore the scale and the shapes of trees and forests. And then to apply that understanding to calculate things like how much carbon there is in trees and, uh, and forests and how that's changing with climate and with disturbance. He's been at the forefront of making new highly detailed 3D measurements of tree structure that provide new insights into how we see, measure and value trees and how we upscale those insights. Professor Disney's worked in a wide range of ecosystems, including tropical and temperate forests and also urban landscapes, as you'll see. So before we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we'll have some time at the end of the lecture for questions and that um, throughout this whole session, you can submit questions by going to Slido in your browser to sli.do and then entering the code UCL trees. So I'll now hand over to Matt for his talk. Okay, thanks, Lewis. I am going to share my screen um, and can everybody see my uh, presentation now? Yeah. Yes, we can, Matt, yes. Good. Uh, hi, welcome, everybody, and thanks for all of those of you who've uh, come along to my talk at this lunchtime. And I'm sorry I can't see you in person. Uh, I'd, obviously, I'd much rather be standing in the front of a, a traditional lecture theatre and talking to people, but um, this is uh, the next best thing. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I've been doing over the past few years using, as Lewis said, using these kind of new techniques to measure trees uh, and kind of look at them in, in a different way um, and look at them in particularly in very fine three dimensional detail um, and what that can tell us about trees and forests more generally. And, you know, th this is, has applications from, for a number of different areas. You'll see as I go through the talk, I focus on some of the kind of new measurement techniques that we use, some of the new tools and technology, and then what that can do in terms of telling us about tree size and shape, um, how we've been applying that in different areas to, to learn new things about trees in familiar environments, as well as some, uh, some more unfamiliar environments, and then about how we're using this to underpin some new kind of satellites and space observations that are going to be happening very soon. So I just thought I'd start with, this was a, an interesting um, piece that, that turned up in Nature earlier this, um, earlier this year, a few weeks ago now. Um, there was a bunch of papers in Nature on forests and they decided that they would have an editorial. And it's quite an interesting call to arms really. Um, you know, in this editorial, we must get a grip on forest science before it's too late. Trees are one of our biggest carbon hopes. Um, Supporting the scientists studying them should be a, a much higher priority. Um, obviously, I would say that. Um, but then there are, uh, you know, there are lots of people um, who've been doing this far longer than I have, and much kind of uh, more challenging environments. And trying to try to get funding for long-term measurements is really, really hard. I'll see. I'll come back to that towards the end. Um, in particular, getting studying forests is a long-term thing. Uh, forests operate on long time scales, trees, very, very long lived organisms. So if we want to understand the relationship to climate, we have to do it on long time scales. And many of our kind of funding models, uh, like our kind of political systems, they're not designed for these kind of longer term uh, funding and uh, monitoring activities. It's much easier to get uh, funding for kind of short term, hey, wow, look at this you know, amazing new problem that I'm going to solve rather than I want to go and monitor somewhere for um, 20, 30 or more years, and it might prove to be interesting. So I think that's an interesting perspective that, you know, has been talked about for a long time in many different places. Um, but, the, you know, the, the link between this kind of funding model and trees and forests is being made more and more explicit. And, and it's, it's very clear that we need to do something about this. <clears throat> 
So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, is you know, what is a tree? What makes up a tree? Uh, I mean, this is an interesting one. This figure in the top left um, was a figure that was um, something I pulled together. I asked my, my daughter, who's a lot older now, but um, when she was in primary school um, and she was about six years old, I asked her class teacher <clears throat> to ask the kids in the school, in their class, to draw their representation of a tree no other instructions just draw draw me a tree and she very kindly did that and i got back these amazing pictures of trees um and i thought it was very illuminating in that it shows that you know from a very early age we all know what a tree is we can all recognize a tree we can draw a tree um these are very different these trees you know everybody's got a slightly different view of it but broadly they're all recognizable as trees so we all kind of know what a tree is, um, and yet trees have this extraordinary variety of shapes and sizes. And uh, you know, one of the most amazing things that, uh, about trees is their ability to adapt um, over long periods of time and to have this amazing plasticity. So they can take on a range of different shapes. So the, the figure underneath this, uh, the bottom bit B there, is a bunch of plane trees that um, I measured in uh, Russell Square, just here in Bloomsbury, just around the corner from UCL. So these are all plane trees. They're London plane, classic London plane. Um, there's a variation of sizes, but you know, the left-hand side of them, there's four or five trees here that are about the same height, um, but they are very different in terms of shape, even though they're all about the same height. This is something I'll come back to. Underneath those trees, there are numbers. And those numbers are estimates of what those trees weigh in terms of tons. So going left to right, we've got seven and a half, 24, 15, six tons. Um, you'll see that those trees are broadly about the same height, and yet they vary dramatically in terms of their mass. And I'll come back to this in that when we try and do large scale estimates of you know, how much carbon there is stored in forests, particularly from satellite data. One of the things, the main things we measure is height, and then we relate height to mass. And you can see here that there's a, there's a massive amount of variation in that height to mass relationship already. So trees can take on a variety of different shapes. Um, going back a bit, this is, th there was a kind of revival of interest um, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, uh, in why forests look like they do, um, you know, why does one particular forest look uh, in a particular way? Why are the trees the size and shape they are? Why are they arranged the way they are? Why is the species distribution how it is? Um, so this is a, an example of some work by Francis Halle, who's a, um, a French ecologist and artist who uh, took it upon himself to, to make some extraordinary recordings of tropical forests, particularly in places like French Guiana, where he made these amazing drawings of, um, of forests showing the variety of structure. Here's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. This is actually Harvard Forest in the US, but it, it's a very beautiful representation of slightly simplified of the structure of this, this forest here in Harvard Forest, showing the different species and showing the canopy trees and the, the second layer and the understory. Um, and so it's, it, it lies somewhere between a kind of, um, a, you know, a qualitative artistic view of that piece of forest and a quantitative, how big, um, you know, how many, how many different types. So, you know, one of the key things here that I'm going to come back to is that, that measuring trees in situ, where they are, measuring them in quite fine detail is really, really hard. Um, if you're not a skilled artist like um, Francis Halle, then how do you do it? Um, and if you can measure those trees in, in great detail, what, do you, what can you do with that information? What sort of things do we want to know? We want to know how much does a tree weigh? So if we know how much a tree weighs, then we can work out how much carbon there is. Broadly, if you take the wet weight of a tree, you cut it down and measure it as it is, then about half of that weight will be water, and then about half of what le what's left will be carbon. You can imagine that's pretty difficult to do just with a single large tree. So how do you do it for a forest? How do you weigh a forest? Um, other questions that, that you want to know the answers to are things like, you know, I already posed this question of, you know, what is a tree? What, what is the, the treeness of this tree? What does an oak tree look like? This picture on the right here, um, is a bunch of different oak trees. So they are, they're all oaks, they're all the same species, but they're all grown in different places. So some of them from 
hedgerows in, in Flanders, some of them from uh, Wynton Woods in Oxfordshire. Um, some of them are open grown trees. Um, you can actually see the open grown trees, these the orange ones are very different, um, but these are all oak trees. Essentially, they're all the same species and they have this fantastic plasticity. So if we can measure um, these trees in, in better detail, can we value them better? And why would we want to do that? So what have I been doing? What kind of measurements have I been making? Well, uh, in the lower left here, you'll see uh, this, this instrument sitting on a tripod here. Um, this is what we call a terrestrial laser scanner or a TLS instrument. Uh, and I'll show you what it does in a second. But essentially, terrestrial laser scanner, you can drag this, this machine around through uh, forests and different environments. And it sends out millions of laser pulses every second, and it records the position of everything that it hits. So what it's doing is it's building up a very detailed three dimensional picture around the instrument by firing out these laser pulses. And every time it hits something, it says it knows exactly how far away that thing was and it knows where it is in three dimensions in X, Y, Z. So. The great thing about terrestrial LIDAR, the reason why it's really useful, is you can you can use it to measure large trees uh, in, in great detail in ways that you just can't do on the ground. So we see uh, this is another colleague of mine trying to measure the diameter of a moderately sized redwood tree here. Um, this is another colleague of mine, uh, Laura Dunks Duncanson, who works for NASA at the uh, University of Maryland using a standard US Forestry Service diameter tape to try and measure this much larger redwood and just running out of running out of tape. So those tapes are the type of tape measures that foresters use the world over to measure the diameter of trees. And we'll come back to why they do that in a minute. Um, here's a very, very large tree in, um, in an, uh, an area of forest in Gabon. And we'll come back to this tree as well, because it's a, it's a particularly special one. It's a very large Moabi tree um, that is absolutely huge. And again, measuring the diameter of that tree is, is an operation in itself. That's a, uh, a three-dimensional view of the tree. And I'll, and I'll come back to this, this tree more generally. Uh, it's about... 45 meters tall and it's about 57 meters across so the crown is absolutely enormous it's a good example of, of a kind of extreme form that the trees can take when they get very very big why is it so spread out and you know why does it have this huge crown like this because isn't that a risk in terms of dropping branches or being prone to wind damage um, it's partly due to collecting enough light for photosynthesis, and it's also partly due to its reproductive strategy, which is to drop large fruits as far away from the parent tree as possible. So here we have um, the TLS, the terrestrial laser scanner in action, sitting on the left, it's kind of spinning around, it's sending out these, these, um, these hundreds of thousands of laser pulses. And you can see how those laser pulses, there is a, a kind of two dimensional view on the right hand side showing you how those laser pulses build up a picture of the forest. All these millions and millions of dots, each one of those dots is a point where the laser pulse hit and uh, we know exactly where that point is in three dimensional space. And the middle one is an example of us using the terrestrial laser scanner in um, Highgate Cemetery. Uh, so this was some work we did uh, a couple of years ago, which I'll, I'll talk about the, the kind of results that came out of that work. I mean, partly this was trying out new things, new techniques and tools that we've developed for, for, for doing this kind of measurement in interesting bits of forest area in and around, you know, where we live and work in London. But it turned out to throw out some, some interesting results about the, the urban forests as well. Um, so here's uh, an example of the kind of data that we get from our terrestrial laser scanner. Um, we can have photographic data as well. Um, so here's a little bit of woodland environment. This is quite a, um, an unusual little piece. This is actually someone's garden. Um, and we were measuring the oak tree in their garden as part of some documentary work we did for the BBC. And I'll get onto that in a second um, with a bit of chronic name dropping. But um, so there's an individual oak tree um, but it's, at the moment, all it is is points. So it's points that are collected by the terrestrial lineup, but it doesn't actually have any meaning other than these collection of points. What we really want is to be able to turn those points into a connected set of volumes, a volume that encloses those points. So how do we do that? 
Um, oops, sorry. I'll repeat that one, come back to that. Um, we do it like this. So we do it by fitting cylinders around those points and joining those cylinders together. If we can do that for this collection of points, this point cloud that represents this oak tree, then es essentially what we can do is we can work out what the volume of this tree is from the tips of the branches down to the base of the trunk. We can work out um, how long the branches are. We can work out how much of the tree is in the crown versus how much of it's in the trunk and so on. Um, this was some work, as I said, that we did for the BBC. They did a really nice job of visualising that. The only problem I've got, if you look at the bottom of the trunk of that tree, it's actually a really bad uh, model fit with this cylinder tipping off to one side. I'd much rather they use one of the better models that, that we have of that. But that aside, we now have a model here that is a set of cylinders that are all joined and connected together in a topologically coherent structure that allows us to estimate the volume of this tree. If we've got the volume of the tree and we know what the tree is made of, essentially the density of the wood that's in there, then we can work out the mass of the tree. So you see that by taking these laser measurements, we can estimate the volume and we can go from volume to mass. So we've effectively been able to weigh that tree or estimate the mass of the tree uh, by using these laser measurements. So whose tree was it? Well, this was uh, Judy Dench, and it was part of this uh, documentary, uh, Judy Dench, My Passion for Trees, that was made by Atlantic Productions. Uh, so we got to go and scan uh, Dame Judy's oak tree in her back garden there, and uh, I picked that still. That was actually the, um, the uh, transcript from the YouTube <laughs> video, where it says it's riveting, but actually looks anything but. Um, what came out of that, just you know, as an example, this tree is about 200 years old. It's 19 meters tall, not very tall, but it's it's wider um, across the crown than it is tall. One of the amazing things when you do this kind of reconstruction of the shape, that you work out that there's nearly 12 kilometers of branches in this tree. So if you took every single branch down to the twigs and laid them all out end to end, it would add up to nearly 12 kilometers, which is I mean, it's pretty amazing. It kind of, you know, it, it blew us away when we first saw those numbers. I mean, what that means, I, I don't really know, but it's another measurement that you can make of trees that we that there's no way we could make, make before. And how much effort the tree puts in to making branches is a crucial part of its uh, the relationship between its its environment and its um, its function, its metabolism, and of course its evolutionary strategy. Um, it weighs about 24 and a half tons, or it, it, it would do if it was uh, made of, of a wood of a particular density. So that's, you know, the kind of thing we, we take these measurements, we can estimate all sorts of size and volume things about the tree, and then we can estimate its mass. Um, questions you should be asking yourself, well, how do you know there's nearly 12 kilometers of branches? And how do you know that that measurement or that estimate of mass you've got is any good? Uh, which would be very valid questions to ask at this point. Why would we want to, to do this, this kind of thing in terms of estimating mass? Well, one of the crucial things that I'll come back to is that most of our estimates, the large scale estimates, regional to global scale estimates of carbon stocks in forests, are basically based on taking a fairly small number of, of measurements of trees that have been cut down. And before they've been cut down or after, they've had their things like their diameter their, around their, their trunk uh, measured and the height measured and then there are these very simple models that predict the mass of the trees from the diameter or the diameter and the height if you've got it so these are called allometric models they're basically size to mass models things that are big way more than things that are small and there are often quite simple fairly clear relationships between things like tree diameter and mass uh, so it turns out that most of our estimates of carbon stocks in, in forests are based on this, these, you know, a few thousand trees in total that have been cut down and weighed. So, for example, there are, you know, there are three trillion trees globally, apparently, and about 1.4 trillion in the tropics. And our best estimate of the carbon stocks of those trees come from extrapolating the masses of these few thousands of harvested trees. Even in order to do those kind of estimates, there is, you know, a huge amount of work goes into uh, forest ecologists and uh, um, 
forest scientists measuring the diameter of thousands of trees in these long established uh, forest plots and then using these relationships between diameter and mass to estimate the, the amount of carbon stored in those forest plots. So that's an extraordinary piece of work in itself. And that's one of the sort of things I was referring to in the beginning about how we fund things and how it's very difficult to fund those long-term forest plots. But if we then go to large scale satellite estimates, they are based on an even shakier foundation. To some extent, they're, they're largely based on estimates of, of forest height. So we're right now we're using height, which we can measure, or estimate from satellites as a proxy for the mass of the forests. What we're basically saying is that tall trees and tall forests weigh more, have more carbon in them than short forests. And while generally that's true, the question is, is how good are those relationships between height and mass or even diameter and mass? So bear in mind that there are, in the tropics, there are 40 to 50,000 tree species. So, we're making some big assumptions that our sample of a few thousand harvested trees represents the relationship between size and mass for these trees more generally. So there's hard ways to, to, um, to measure the mass of a tree. The, the really hard way is to do it properly by cutting it down and weighing it piece by piece. So here's an example of some work we did in Brazil. So that was cutting down a fairly large tree, that's a 50 meter tall tree, and you can see that there's been an area cleared around it so that we could fell it without damaging it too much, and it's felled onto a tarpaulin by some very skilled um, uh, tree felling experts so that we can collect the crown material. And then even weighing this uh, single tree, you know, it, it weighs, well, it weighs some tens of tons, uh, and so it has to be cut into sections and each one of those sections has to be weighed. I mean, you know, mixed feelings about this in the sense that this is a very beautiful tree. Um, it's in an area that's going to be logged anyway. So that's how we were able to get permission to do this. So these trees were probably going to be cut down for logging anyway. But you can see on the right hand side there that just to weigh this single tree, each one of those discs weighs a couple of hundred kilos and requires about four or five people to lift it and weigh it. So weighing this single tree is a hell of a job it's a real pain but if you can do terrestrial laser measurements first then you can cut it down and weigh it and you can compare those two you can start to convince people that oh my terrestrial lidar says this and i have some evidence to suggest that the the, the estimates of mass that i'm getting do agree with real measurements so when we ha have done studies like this, and there have been a number of studies now looking at doing terrestrial LIDAR and doing the harvest, uh, the proper harvest measurements as well. So, you know, I sort of make that point at the top here. Harvesting is the only true measurement of biomass. The only way you can weigh the amount of carbon in a tree or in a forest is to cut it down and weigh it. OK, obviously you want to avoid that as far as possible, but you do need to do it a few times in order to convince people that this kind of approach works, particularly when you're proposing to do it in a new way, as we are doing here with terrestrial LIDAR. People have been doing it in other ways for a long time in forestry and other, other kinds of fields. And if you come along with a new method, you better make really sure that you can convince people that you know, the way that you're doing it is actually um, as good as you claim it is. Um, it's no use just rocking up and going, hey, we can do this, it's fantastic, look at the new technology, it's great, you don't need to worry about tape measures anymore. Um, you know, there are pros and cons to doing it this way, but the, at the very least, you need to be able to convince people that it works. So what we showed from this work, for example, was that um, when we do the TLS and we do the harvest, they agree to within a few percent of the mass of a tree that weighs, you know, upwards of 20, to 20 tons. Um, one of the interesting things, so in a way, that's good, that's great, it, you know, it agrees really well, and all the studies that have done TLS and Harvest have shown that um, they agree to within a few percent. This is the only one that was done full harvest in the tropics, and particularly in the Amazon. Um, so, so far, this is the only one that's done that. One of the things that, the, that this, these kind of measurements threw up that was somewhat unexpected is that you can see the, the highlighted boxes there, that the you know the upper part of the bar chart there shows how much of the mass is in the crown 
So for the, the tallest tree there, it's about 42%. And for that slightly shorter tree there, it's about 62%. Um, the minimum is 40% in the crown and it goes up to over 60%. So up to 60% of the mass of these trees that are 30, 40, 50 meters tall is in the crown. Um, and it's very variable. And that was somewhat unexpected in the sense that the, the kind of allometric model size to mass relationships, these fairly simple models, assume that the majority of the mass is in the trunk. Um, and for, you know, for lots of trees, that is true. But we, we were showing that for large trees in a, in a you know, random piece of tropical forest in the Amazon, actually, there was significant up to half or more than half of the mass was in the crown, which is somewhat unexpected. Also, that it's very variable. The amount of mass that's in the crown versus the, uh, the trunk was actually pretty variable. That then means that it, it, the, there's a potential for large uncertainties in those simple relationships between diameter and mass um, that people are using to underpin our wider estimates of carbon stocks. Um, this is another example of doing similar kind of work, but without the destructive harvest in this case. Um, so this is looking at northwestern US, at coastal redwoods. Um, so these trees are some of the tallest in the world. They're not the giant redwoods. It's the um, same families, different species. Um, so this is the uh, Sequoia sempervirens, uh, and they are the ones that live on the kind of coastal areas. They grow very tall, slightly slimmer than the, than the giant redwoods that grow further to the east. These areas uh, where um, these, re these redwoods are have some of the highest uh, biomass density in the world. So they can have biomass um, up to five times what would be found in this typical tropical forest, simply because the trees are so massive. Um, what we find, again, when we did our TLS estimates of these trees, that they agrees to within about 2% of measurements that were done by dedicated tree climbing groups. So there is a group that's been doing some measurements of redwoods led by um, a guy called Steve Sillett, um, who climbs these trees and measures individual branches right to the top. And our group, our measurements of, of uh, volume agreed with theirs to within a few percent. So that's great. Again, there are these two independent ways of estimating volume of the trees, and they agree very closely. Um, they wouldn't have to. Um, if they didn't agree, you know, then the argument is, well, is one of them right, the other one wrong, or are they both wrong? Um, uh, the point is they agreed very closely. Doesn't mean that they're right, but it is some evidence to suggest that there's at least consistency. The important thing that came out of this is a graph like this, which shows that um, when you use one of the most widely used models that is used, these simple empirical models that's used to predict the biomass of forests like this, diameter to mass relationship, it under predicts compared to our TLS data by about 30 to 40 percent. So that model that I quoted there, Chojnaki uh, et al., is used by the US Forestry Service. It's used by NASA for some of their satellites uh, derived estimates of biomass. It underpins a very, very wide range of biomass estimates in areas that have tall conifers, not even just redwoods. Um, and yet it seems to under predict massively 30 to 40%. So moving back to the UK then, well, you know, one of the questions we, we're sort of asking when we're seeing these kind of measurements is, um, well, OK, do we know the carbon stocks in uh, in UK woodlands? We must know them better than we do in tropical forests or remote you know, areas of the world or in redwood forests. We must know how much carbon is stored in, in UK woodlands because these things have been studied for years. They've been managed and harvested. And, you know, we understand these things, surely. So we spent quite a lot of time over the last 10, five to 10 years working in um, a place called White and Woods, just outside Oxford, that is owned by Oxford University. And it's the quote unquote, most studied piece of, of forest in the world. People have been doing undergraduate dissertations and PhD projects and research projects there for um, 60, 70 years. So it is very, very well studied. What's the best estimate of carbon stocks in this place? Well, it turns out that when we've done terrestrial laser scanning, TLS-based estimates, and we estimate how much biomass we see in the, this in White and Woods, we get about 1.8, so nearly twice as much as the best apparent um, current model estimates, which when we first 
did this we are like this this is not right you know we've got this wrong we've we've definitely made a mistake here um yeah, there's no way that it can be kind of double the amount of carbon that is stored in there so we then started to unpick how the carbon estimates and the sorts of models that we use to estimate how much carbon is stored in in this woodland um, previously um, it turns out that there was there's an allometric model um, developed by a guy called Bob Bunce, who, uh, who wrote this paper in 1968, basically where he did some harvest of some trees, he cut down some, some uh, beech trees and some oak trees, and he weighed them, and he measured the diameter, and he plotted them, and he got this lovely relationship, um, and he fitted a model to it. And it's that model that is so very, very widely used, this model of Bob Bunce from 1968. Even in his paper, though, in 1968, where did he cut his trees down? He did them mostly on um, upland uh, sloping areas in the Lake District on quite acidic soils um, with fairly heavily managed woodland. And he said himself in that paper in 1968, um, look, th this model fits really well to the data I've collected. You probably shouldn't use this model anywhere else in Britain because these trees are not typical of woodland trees in the UK. And yet, it's been done. So why? Um, just zooming in on this a bit, if we compare our uh, TLS data estimates of biomass, AGB stands for above ground biomass. So it's the amount of mass that's stored in the, the woody material above ground. So um, the, on the y-axis here, we have our TLS estimates. And on the x-axis here, we have our um, uh, the allometric model fit. You'll see that, again, this is this almost 50% um, you know, uh, uh, underestimate by the allometric model here. We get almost twice as much in the TLS. If you look in the left-hand panel, we've zoomed in on this little pink square down the bottom there. Why have we done that? If we look at the, the right-hand side, the right-hand side is a zoom in on that very, very the smaller parts of those the, the, the graph there. That pink square represents the size of the trees that Bob Bunce used in his original allometric sample when he did that work in 1968. So as he says himself, these trees are pretty small compared to much larger, more mature trees. Um, you know, you probably shouldn't use it elsewhere. And, you know, implicitly in this kind of thing is, well, you probably shouldn't extrapolate your relationship off the end of the scale here, out to trees that are five times uh, large. I mean, it's, that's one of the things we learn in very basic kind of statistics and math classes is when you fit a line to a set of points, um, you are very unwise to extrapolate your line beyond the end of the points, unless you've got a good reason for thinking that your line has some fundamental reason for existing. If you just fit a line to a set of points, line of best fit, you're not allowed to extrapolate it on uh, off the end here. And yet we do with allometric models because the assumption is broadly made that size to mass relationships scale up. They're kind of invariant. If they work down here, they should work up there because, you know, why would it be different? So here's a, you know, a picture of all the trees in, in one hectare. I, just, I really like this picture. So I liked it so much. I had a T-shirt made. Uh, I had various T-shirts made of this one. Um, Maybe that was tempting fate somewhat in that this work is uh, in review for publication. We've been trying to get it published for about three years uh, and run up against some very stiff criticism, in part due to making claims like we think that there might be an underestimate of nearly 100% of biomass in, in areas like White and Woods because that has some quite profound implications of the amount of carbon. Basically, we found twice as much carbon in UK woodlands overnight. Uh, I'm being slightly facetious, obviously, but that, that is so, sort of the implication is that we're currently underestimating how much carbon is stored in UK woodlands, which from one perspective, hey, that's great. There's more carbon in UK woodlands than we thought. But it's also bad because it means if you lose areas of woodland, then you're losing more carbon than you thought you were. So getting those numbers right is really critical. Um, why did this kind of persist? Um, as I say, Bob Bunce, who's pictured down here, and um, rather sadly, so Bob was involved. We kind of tracked him down. He was semi-retired or re retired. Um, and we tracked him down and hassled him and said, do you know that lots of people are using your model for, for doing this kind of stuff? And he was um, both bemused and amused by it. He thought it was kind of funny and like, why would people do this? You know, I said in the paper, don't do this. 
And we were like, yeah, well, good question. Why have they done it? Um, and we found dozens of papers that had used this Bunce equation. And almost worse than that, there are papers that, are, that cite Bob's paper and use that estimate. And then there are other papers that cite the papers that cite Bob's paper and so on. There are there are papers that we found are three removes away from Bob's paper that cite this as a model that you can use for mixed beech oak woodland. Um, but sadly, he died um, earlier on this year while we were waiting for this this paper to be published. So, you know, as and when this paper does get through, uh, we're hopefully going to put a, a tribute into it because he he really wasn't interested in this work to some, you know, he he was funded to do this early on in his PhD, uh, in his postdoc career. Um, he was much more interested in um, the kind of flowers and woodland flora. And he went on to develop a countryside survey in Britain and had a long and distinguished career. Uh, he became a sort of world leading expert on woodland flora. And he left this stuff behind, people still using it. They're using it in urban areas as well. So talking about urban areas, um, you know, we've done some work on applying our terrestrial lidar to urban areas. So you'll see the picture behind me in the backdrop here. That's the, the trees there, these oak trees in, um, in Hampstead Heath. Oak trees uh, or trees in urban areas are, are, you know, live very different lives. Uh, I mean, there's a great paper down there from Lucy Hutra, Boston. Um, they have a different life um, cycle. They have different pressures. Um, different kinds of environments. And yet, again, when we're trying to estimate what uh, we you know, try to measure and understand the, you know, things like carbon storage and ecosystem services of trees, we're very often transferring what we know about trees in their more natural environments to what we, to, to their, to these urban environments, which are very different. Um, and one of the fascinating things about, you know, kind of urban trees is they very often tell a story. These particular oaks, you see the picture on the left hand side from the mid 19th century. These are up on Hampstead Heath, where the whole heath was completely blasted uh, when they were essentially digging for chalk and sand that was used for construction. Those trees got left behind for no other reason as far as I can figure out, other than they were used to tie off um, ropes that were used for the, for the mining operations that were going on. And now they're surrounded by this piece of, sort of secondary oak woodland that, that's subsequently been planted there. Um, so we started looking at kind of whether we could use the same approaches that we use for um, tropical forests and other areas for understanding a bit more about urban forests. So, you know, by many definitions um and there are lots of definitions of you know what is a forest um there are dozens over a hundred definitions of what is a forest but london is a forest there are more than eight million trees um and they come in a range of sizes and there, you know there's some areas of these these urban forests that are rather old questions for you know who has access to these these urban forests does it matter how much is the urban forest worth and of course th that question there is a somewhat loaded question because of course in urban areas, it very much matters how much we value it, because how much we value it is very much a function of then of how much we spend on looking after it, on restoring it, about providing access to people. And of course, during the pandemic, this this became a you know a very hot topic more generally. Um, going back to the work we did in in um, in Highgate Cemetery and in Camden more generally, we we. Did a map of, of biomass in Camden based on some of our ground based data and using some airborne data as well. And we showed that there are these little pockets of urban areas, so places like Highgate and places like Hampstead, where the biomass density, the amount of carbon per unit area, is equivalent to what it would be in a temperate tropical rainforest. So, very high carbon density. Obviously, those areas are very small, but what it implies is that trees can grow very well in urban areas if they're kind of left to get on with things, if they're looked after or even given some benign neglect, like they are in the kind of typical churchyard situation. So valuing trees right, particularly in urban areas, is really is really crucial. And how do we value trees? And it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do for all sorts of reasons. Um, and the very one of the big problems that we've sort of seen um, time and again is that there seems to be a um, a tendency to to value trees in urban areas very conservatively. So this is the kind of the, the, the sort of definitive valuation report for um, for London. And I'm, I'm not picking on the numbers here to say that they're right or wrong, but 
one aspect of it, they tend to be very conservative. And as again, as far as I can tell, the reason for that is that if you open the values up to how we value the amenity and the aesthetic values of trees, those numbers get very uncertain and they can get very large. And people who are valuing them and the people who are tasked with doing this, everybody is much more comfortable with saying, well, I know that this value is low, the, the trees in London are worth at least this much, but um, they could be worth a lot more, but we can all agree that they're worth at least this much. So, you know, the, the bottom line, literally and metaphorically here, figure here, the total annual benefits for trees in London is about 130, 133 million pounds, which sounds like a lot. So this is the, the sort of annual benefit to do with shade and water runoff and temperature mitigation and so on, pollution removal. But there's eight and a half million trees in London. So that works out at about 16 pounds per tree per year. That's not the same as the replacement um, cost of the trees, but it's it's you know it's um, it's a value that is actually an extremely low value, right? So it's probably worth a lot more than that. But if you if you value it low, these things tend to get baked into these kind of uh, policy very quickly because they are um, you know e values that are easy to communicate. The number of trees, the canopy cover, and so on gets baked into these things, policy decisions very quickly without questions being asked. So now it's all about increasing canopy cover without thinking about, well, what is canopy cover? Is all canopy cover alike? Is it all good? Is it all equally good? Is some canopy cover better than others? And of course it is the case that some canopy cover is much more valuable and has much more value than others. There's a rush to plant trees everywhere. And this comes back to this funding issue. It's much easier to get money to plant trees, to new trees, than it is to get money to look after them. And so um, th these two pictures on the right, kind of classics of the genre. I could do a whole talk just based on local authority figures planting trees in urban areas, which then don't live any longer than um, the next electoral cycle. Um, you know, we look at these these examples here. These were, were examples that were taken earlier on this year. So this is the mayor of Hackney planting. The 50 trees, redwoods, were planted on Hackney marshes. Um, six months later, they looked like this. Half to two thirds of them have died. Um, obviously, it was a very dry summer, but who was looking after them? Where was the money for the longer term care? The bottom picture, local councillors planting trees in Gloucester. Um, this one made kind of main news because 12,000 trees out of 12,800 that were planted earlier this year have died. And, oh, it, you know, it was hot summer and it was difficult. And we, you know, we didn't, they didn't have any plan B for who was going to look after it. I did some rough calculations there. It, I would say very conservatively, there's a 1.2 to 1.5 million pounds worth of trees and effort that's wasted there. Plant half as many trees and use the other 750 grand to employ somebody or a team of people for 10 years to look after those trees. So there's a rush to plant trees because it, you, you're seen to be doing something. And yet it's very you get a nice photo opportunity with the local authority, you know, the mayor or whatever, the picture in the paper. You don't get the money to look after those trees. So I'll just finish off by covering a couple of things. So we've been looking at some um, redwoods in the UK. So I, I noticed some were planted there in Hackney. Um, when you start looking for redwoods in the UK, they're all over the place. They were planted in the mid 19th century. Um, and there's a move to plant more of these trees now because they are fast growing and they absorb a lot of carbon and, and people like them. I mean, they, they end up can grow quite large and quite rapidly in the UK. Here's some ones just in Epping. It's an interesting point that you know, there are new buildings around these, but the trees have been left. Um, and so it's interesting that sometimes redwoods, because they're somewhat exotic, seem to be left alone, whereas perhaps native species would have been cut down or moved or when the new buildings were being built here. So we had some work uh, on this recently with an MSc student who showed that the, the, the redwood trees in the UK are actually doing pretty well. Um, and, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, all growing almost as fast as they do in the US and they're accumulating carbon very rapidly. Does that mean we should be planting them everywhere and not investing in, um, in uh, you know, the, the, the longer term care? No, it doesn't. So the last bit then, um, some of these measurements that, that I'm making are going into um, our understanding of how we measure uh, biomass from uh, tropical forests. And uh, the European Space Agency, 
um, as shown in this, this kind of slick promotional video here, they are launching a, uh, a new, bio, a new mi mission, satellite mission called Biomass, um, which I dislike the name because it's confusing. Um, if you're talking about biomass, do you mean biomass with a capital B or biomass with a lowercase b? Um, so the ESA biomass mission is being launched uh, next year, hopefully. Uh, I'm actually going to see the instrument in situ on Friday at Airbus. Um, that paragraph there is crucial. You know, the, the, the difficulty of collecting ground-based measurements. Um, without the ground-based measurements, um, you cannot say how well you're doing from the satellite measurements. So that the ground measurements of, uh, and that's not just the TLS stuff, I should add, it's very much to do with the, the, you know, the hard measurements of measuring diameters and species types in forests all over the world. Doing those kind of um, long-term hard measurements to make is crucial to understanding how well your 200 million euro satellite is going to do. So these measurements are giving us a, a different way to see trees, um, improving our estimates of carbon potentially from, from ground and space, giving us new insights into the sort of structure of trees, particularly and how that relates to function. And, and they are another tool in the army that we could use to value trees better. Um, but alongside that, we need better ways to fund and maintain field measurements and also thinking about planting trees. We need to do those kinds of things better, not always rushing to plant new trees, thinking about the trees that you've got. And I just make that point at the end that, that trees and forests operate on very long time scales. So you need to fund and measure and you know do the science on these long time scales as well. So thank you very much. That's great, Matt. Thanks so much for um, uh, for that that talk and the, those uh, interesting insights into into trees and your 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 research and perspectives. So um, I'm going to read out some of the the, the questions from uh, Slido. So you can still post on Twitter all those up uh, questions. Um, the uh, the the top one is kind of a bit. Um, well, what about? In it is from Martin, and it says, "Nice talk, Matt. Can we reliably link above ground lidar estimates to below ground biomass estimates? How much of the carbon are we missing?" So you've got this beautiful stuff measuring above ground, but what about what's below the ground? Um, so my usual, rather facetious answer to that question is that that's somebody else's problem, um, and the answer is no. It's it, you. you you can't do you can't link those directly um you need to do that another way lidar is not going to help you uh, people have been using things like ground penetrating radar but doing above ground biomass is 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 hard doing below ground biomass root biomass is an order of magnitude harder again uh so it's it's just a really difficult thing to do particularly you know you can do it destructively but again it's really very very difficult because you have to preserve fine root biomass out to quite long distances. So in general, um, there are, again, very crude relationships that people use to relate how much above ground biomass to below ground biomass. Oh, it's about 60, 40, 50, 50. We'll use that until someone else comes up with a better number. You know, and so that, you know, that's still waiting for people to come up with better numbers. Yeah, and a lot to discover when someone works out how to, how to measure it. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, okay. So, um, from Andy Beverton, does the woody material and stem density change significantly in different sections of the tree? So, so you talked about all this mass in the, the crowns compared yep. to the trunks. Is that is it different density? Or yes, it is. That's a really good question. Hi, Andy. <laughs> I recognise that name. Um, yes, it varies quite a lot. So, even in the the paper that we published there with those trees and that's another uncertainty typically um you know when you have very hyper diverse tropical forest plots you don't know what species you're dealing with half the time and so you might know it's a kind of order family name um so what value do you use for the wood density so in our big trees there the, the wood density varied by um a factor of two or three from the trunk to some of the branches um you measured the density 
Yeah, so we measured the wood density of all of these different sections. Um, if you took an average value of, of all of those different sections and you weighted it by the amount of, of this particular tissue versus that particular tissue, you wouldn't be too far off um, in terms of the overall wood density of that tree, but it does vary significantly. And it, it varies within a tree, it varies, it varies within species, and it varies between species. And the, then the problem you have is that if you're trying to extrapolate over large areas, you have to use basically a single number. And so it's about 0.5. That's a number that's broadly used for looking at wide scale estimates. That's how much um, uh, the, the, the density, so it's the, number of, uh, it's the amount of carbon in grams per centimeter cubed of dry wood material. It varies in our tree between 0.25 and 1.2. So, you know, on, on average, it was about 0.45 for that big tree. But yes, it, it varies a lot. Yeah. Because so another big uncertainty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, I mean, there's amazing new things you can do with this laser scanning, but it, it you know, it, it, it measures the shape, the volume. Yeah. Like so you, you, you yeah. still yeah. need all of those yeah. other measurements. But then, of course, all the other estimates that we've had up to this point also rely on making big assumptions <clears> about <throat> things like wood density and so on. So we're, we're no worse off than we were before. Yeah, great. OK, um, next one is a nice friendly question. What's it like to work with NASA and ESA in these endeavors? Um, it, it can be good. I mean, it's that's a big broad question. I mean, um, you know, working with the space agencies, they are very much focused, particularly they're, they're focused on the space aspect. So that's great. They're focused on the delivering, you know, the instrument, this instrument into space. And um, that can be, you know, take a long time from the, the, the kind of conception of an idea of an instrument like biomass um, to launching. It's actually been much longer than this, but it typically could be 10 years and it can be longer from the sort of, you know, early designs, proposals, <clears> up to actually getting measurements from this thing. It can be 10 years or longer. That can be frustrating, but that's how these things get, get done. Um, the other frust sort of frustrating thing I'll say is that they, uh, in focusing so much on, on that side of things, they, um, you know, one of the reasons why there's been a call for kind of better funding for ground-based measurements is because these spaces typically don't fund that sort of thing. They say, look, our remit is to put stuff in hardware and space. It's national and other international agencies' jobs to fund the kind of ground-based measurements that will allow you to use these science, the space-based measurements better, but that's not our job to fund it. That can be a kind of frustrating take on, on this. Um, on the other hand, they are, you know, they're very, they, you know, they, they tend to be open to listening to those arguments and so on. So and they they do fund you know some of the stuff that, that I do, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bite the hand that feeds me there. Um, you know some of this this work is is clearly funded by NASA and the European Space Agency, and if that ends up meaning that we do the science better in the long run, then yeah, great. I mean, I, I would comment also to be fair to to NASA, they have a slightly different remit to ESA. They have a science remit as well as the um, yeah just the space remit, and so they've funded so much of of um, global change science over the yes and that's true and opening up data sources and things like that so those those things uh you know this drive towards open satellite data has come from but I mean, it's not come solely from the space agency it's come from you know the political will for for um you know legislators have said if taxpayers are paying for this stuff it ought to be open but then they've they've developed those models to allow it to happen yeah yeah like the eu copernicus program which yeah. we're Sadly, no longer part of it for political reasons, but that's another talk. So um, a nice one now on temporal dynamics. Um, and I hope you're going to talk about Kim's stuff here. How do we detect the 3D change of trees when we have TLS data of this sort? So there's short and long time scale. So there's work. So Kim Calders, who is a colleague of mine and you know who, who did most of this measurement stuff here on my T-shirt. Uh, so Kim... Um, has done pioneering work on doing uh, TLS measurements of eucalypt forests that are growing as part of one of these um, so-called face experiments, the free air CO2 enrichment experiment, where you bleed, you bubble CO2 into the environment and you raise the CO2 to answer questions about how um, elevated CO2 in the atmosphere 
you know, what's a 600 uh, parts per million world going to do to trees? Are they going to grow faster and how much faster? So Kim's been doing repeated measurements every couple of years of these eucalypt forests. And it's, you know, you basically have to do the very careful measurements of exactly the same um, trees and you, know, you can actually see them growing in, in, you know, year on year. So you can see the development of the trees. You can see the changes in structure, branches go, they fall off. There's also um, people have been doing measurements um, on a you know kind of diurnal basis, so measuring minute by minute or hour by hour through the course of the day <clears throat> as trees um, raise and lower their branches with uh, water pressure, and so you can actually see that happening in um, when you do these measurements. And so the first kind of measurements of those sort have been done over the last um, the last five years or so. And it's really interesting. It's showing, again, how much movement there is in a tree um, throughout the course of the day. I mean, we're used to seeing plants with heliotropism and so on and, and wilt and so on, but even trees do it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Which reminds me of those um, really old experiments people used to do in wind tunnels of trying to look at trees and whatever. Yeah, so... You know, TLS has been used somewhat for that, not so much for the, the wind tunnel itself, but once you have this three dimensional representation, you can do things with it, like build computational fluid dynamics models and find that element structural analysis where you can expose your three dimensional model. You can put the stress and strain properties in there, and then you can put it in a in a in a fluid flow model and say what this tree would do, what the forces on it would be, and it, that will help you answer questions like uh, you know how susceptible it will be to fracturing under wind load, um, you know what it does if it's very tall. What are the what are the limits on tree growth in terms of height? I mean that's still an open question. What determines the very tallest tall trees? How tall could they be? Is it wind? Is it gravity? Water? Hydraulics? You know, that's still an open question. Yeah, I guess you need the anchoring, the, the root properties for those things. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. So um, you mentioned the ESA biomass mission, but what can you tell us about NASA using lasers from the International Space Station? Measuring so, um, yeah, Na uh, NASA have their uh, JEDI mission because it's called JEDI because, of course, it is. Um, they've absolutely rinsed the Star Wars link, um, and that's been up since about 2018 19. So, in one of the early slides that I showed, um, Laura Duncanson standing there, she's one of the chief scientists on the JEDI mission. Um, and so that's been up there about three or four years, sending down um, laser pulses that hit the ground with a diameter of about 20 meters. And JEDI is cool because it's the first instrument that a laser instrument like this. So it's, it's the same as my terrestrial LIDAR here. It's the same as this, this instrument sitting on the tripod here, sort of. It's the same measurement principle. Um, and it's been sending down these footprints for about four years, but it's the first instrument of this type that was specifically designed for looking at trees and forests. And it is measuring forest heights um, across the globe with kind of unprecedented accuracy. Um, so that's a really good thing to be able to do. And it's giving us, again, because we're using height often as a proxy for mass, it's enabling us to do that better. It's also um, giving us information about the vertical structure, how trees, uh, tree crowns are arranged in terms of size and shape. And we've been doing some work on it in urban areas as well. The, one of the limitations of JEDI um, is that it's on the space station, which if it weren't on the space station, it wouldn't have got launched. So that's a good thing. Bad thing is that it's on this weird kind of wobbly space station orbit. So you don't get data above or below 51 degrees north and south. So large parts of kind of boreal forests and so on. So it goes up just north of Oxford. So it covers London and southeast, you know, the southern part of the UK. Um, but it's not a global instrument and it's a footprint instrument. It's not an image based instrument, um, but it's showing some really cool results that um, are giving us a snapshot of the state of the world's forests in a way that we've never really been able to do, do before. It's reaching the end of its, uh, its mission time and there's a petition out there to keep Jedi up on the space station for another couple of years. So if you're interested, search out the NASA Jedi with a G, G-E-D-I, and sign that petition because it, it, it is really changing the way we see things. And it will also complement what the ESA biomass mission will do. So both instruments on their own do cool things. Together, they are more than the sum of their parts. And that's you know, one of the great things about 
what's been happening with this kind of work is that this is one of the best examples I've seen of NASA and Jedi, uh, NASA and ESA working really closely together in in collaboration to achieve you know more than the sum of their parts. Yeah, that's excellent. So um, so we're now at, uh, at two o'clock at the close of the uh, the talk. So thank you so much for. Um, for your your presentation and your thoughts on these matters, Matt, Thank and you. for um, uh, discussing these uh, the the questions. There's more questions that you might want to look at uh, online as well. Maybe get back to people. And thank you to the audience for uh, for, for for viewing this and for asking those uh, interesting and relevant questions. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks, Lewis.